Welcome to the Create a Push, an intimate and diverse artist interview series. Here, artists and makers of all kinds share tips, advice, knowledge, and inspiration that you can learn from. I'm your host, Sherry O'Neill, a photographer, artist, writer, and educator. This series is a part of the Learn and Create platform to help artists further their education in creativity, art, and business. Today, I have Twyla Lambert Clark. She is a fiber artist here in Nashville. Welcome. Thanks so much for having me, Sherry. I'm okay. delighted. I'm glad you're here. I love your clothes. You mean the clothes that I sew? Thank you. I appreciate that a lot. So let's go back and talk about your childhood. Where does your art inspiration come from? I'm from Shirley, Massachusetts. I grew up in New England. The town that I'm from was an original Shaker community. And I was always fascinated by that and read a lot about that and used to bike ride where the Shakers used to live. I think my wanting to learn how to weave and then sew was a result of that and the fact that my grandfather was a weaver in the textile mills. I never got to see him actually at his looms weaving, but I knew that's what he did to support his family. I think that always inspired me for somehow wanting to be involved with textiles. My dad was a school teacher. Mom worked part-time at the post office and had six kids. Mom was very, very overwhelmed. Are any of your other siblings artistic? My sister Paula, who lives in the Columbus, Ohio area, she's a poet and she's an artist. When she was in high school, she suddenly announced one day that she was going to go to Boston and go to sign painting school. And everyone was just amazed because it seemed to come out of nowhere. She knew that she wanted to be an artist and I think she figured out she could support herself by being a sign painter and then do her art on the side. My sister Karen, she was a natural with a needle. She could just embroider just beautifully. She had the patience of a saint and could make the smallest mistake that no one would see and she'd pull it out. She didn't try to do it to sell or anything. I had a great aunt who was interior designer, my grandfather's sister, and then he had another sister who was a nun who taught art classes. Those are the creatives for all influences. I never really thought that that applied to me. They were out there. They were kind of like people I barely knew but had heard family stories that that's what they did. It was all these little things from when I was a child, but it really started to, for me, come together when I moved here and was able to take classes. When I moved to Nashville, my mom, I had told her that the house we bought had a fireplace. And she went ahead and bought me a spinning wheel because she thought it would look pretty in front of a fireplace. And I wanted to learn how to spin. So I found out Centennial Park had weaving classes. And someone told me, well, if you take the weaving class, the teacher is also a spinner. Maybe she'll teach you about spinning. So that's how I learned how to weave. I remember weaving a rug out of cut up denim jeans and I remember putting the warp on the loom and the warp was really colorful it had like lime green and some beige and some pink but it was stripes of color I remember the teacher looking at it and saying I just don't know how that's going to look I had um, cut up all these jeans into strips like an inch or two and then started weaving the jeans in that background of blue with all those colors it came out so pretty I had that rug for years and used to just throw it in the washing machine and I think it probably lasted about 10 years before it finally just started falling apart That kind of started the whole idea of, well, maybe I could put all this together. Maybe I could become the fiber artist. I heard about Aramont, the school for arts and crafts over in Gatlinburg. I saved money and took a class in felting. And felting is when you're taking wool and rather than spinning it, you're actually brushing it into layers and then putting those layers together with like water and soap. The teacher was Lane Goldsmith. She was just so encouraging. And I remember her looking at my little practice pieces and saying, well, how did you think to put those colors together? That works really well. I just remember feeling encouraged and just loving it. Um, I had joined the Hand Weavers Guild, which most of those women, they were basically taking classes and doing it full time. And I was working two or three jobs and doing it when I could. I started trying to learn how to spin. You moved to Nashville in 81, and what were you doing at the time? I went to a company called Tropical Design. I just love taking care of plants, and the owner was Barry Lapidus, a very, very nice man. I became the plant lady. I took care of plants in hotels, in offices, in lobbies of businesses, in restaurants. I did that for almost nine years. It was a fun job because I could get up early and go to my accounts like six, seven in the morning, and get all my work done by two o'clock and then go to a matinee movie. I worked 
pretty much by myself and took care of these large plant installations and weed and spray for the pests and trim and you walk away and it looks so much prettier. My elbows finally wore out from lifting the buckets of water. I had such pain in my elbows, I couldn't lift the water anymore. Couldn't figure out what to do next. Had a medical disability for a while. I didn't have college, so um, didn't really have a whole lot to fall back on. Tried a lot of odd jobs and applied for a job. American Color was opening up in Brentwood hiring entry level. So I started at $5 an hour and working from 4 p.m. to 4 a.m. And that was at least six days a week. I was an assistant to the table strippers. The plates for the printing presses were made from film, but the table strippers were cutting ruby lith, putting together all the different pieces to create the final film for printing presses. And I was basically an assistant to them. Learning how to run the, the old-fashioned cameras to take the pictures for the ads, learning how to do different types of proofing, all those basic things in the printing world that pretty much don't exist anymore. I needed the money. I was married to a songwriter who wasn't bringing in any money, and I just worked every single hour I could. You basically got half an hour lunch, and you left when they told you you could leave. The days were 14, 16 hours. I was glad to be able to make the money. I learned how to do color correcting on the computers, and basically slowly but surely worked my way up through printing to getting into customer service, then ended up getting into sales. Started out selling digital printing and then ended up selling sheet fed and web, but I sold commercial print. The one thing that you would recognize, the uh, Cracker Barrel children's menu, the little four-page activity book, I printed that for years and years and years. <laughs> four million, four times a year. You did a lot of book printing. I loved books. They take a lot of planning between picking the paper, the type of binding, the cover, if it's going to be foil stamped, embossed, debossed, laminated, there's a lot of intricate details in, in making books. I think I gained the reputation of being like the go-to, hold someone's hand and help them through the book process and make the book successful. And I loved it because the graphic designers are the creatives and I got to help the creatives learn how to be super creative and successful. Being able to be involved from the very beginning, I could make sure that the books were budgeted correctly, they picked the right paper, help with the schedule, just advise for all the steps of the way for, for planning the timeline. I worked on all kinds of books for like the Nashville Symphony, the Convention Center downtown. I did the book that documents their whole art collection. A lot of beautiful, fancy, incredible books. And the books end up being beautiful pieces oh, yeah. of art. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Books were fun. I, I loved it. You left there? I was doing the books, but I was doing business cards and sheet fed and web and signage and then all of it. And the hours are so intense. Through the weekend, every night till 10 or 11 o'clock at night. I did it for a long, long, long time and the job was physically killing me. I had this thought in my head that I wanted to be a production sewer. I thought that it would fit me that maybe I could figure out how to have my own business to work from home, bringing in money and doing something I really liked. The Nashville Fashion Alliance is a nonprofit I had done some printing for. And I'd heard about this sewing school, the Sewing Training Academy. I called Trishana Quincy, who was the director of the school, one day and asked for a tour. And she started laughing at me on the phone because she said, Twilight, it's one room. I said, well, I want to see it. So I went and talked to her. She let me into the program. I went to my boss at the print company and said, I'm giving you my notice. I want to go be a production sewer. And he didn't believe me. I was making very good money. I was selling in the millions. I had a really good book of work. A lot of people found it hard to believe that I would walk away from that, but I think at a point in your life when you realize something that you're doing for money is killing you, you realize you just can't keep doing it. The quality of life is important, yeah. Yeah, and I don't know why, but I kept thinking I could be good at sewing and fiber arts. Back when I had easier jobs that didn't pay a lot, but I had more free time and I could weave and all that, I'd always thought a lot of the weavers did beautiful work, but their finishing was terrible. So many of them didn't know how to sew. And in my mind, I'd always thought if I could weave, I'd have to know how to sew beautifully to bring it all together. So I had this self-imposed goal of wanting to be the fiber artist where the finishing was as nice as the fabrics. If someone turned a rug upside down or looked at the coat that I sew and look on the inside, that they'd see that the inside was as beautiful as the outside. So that's been my goal. Is that what the finishing is? You don't see exposed seams. Everything is finished on the inside and it just looks beautiful. 
it's a lot of hard work to learn how to do all that correctly. You have to understand that different fabrics take different types of finishing. It's an awful lot to, to put it all together, but I'm loving the challenge of all that. And that's what I'm aspiring to be a sewer and a weaver where people look at what I'm doing and say, it's beautiful on so many levels, that the colors work together, the different fabrics work together, but the finishing is done really, really well. And at the same time, trying to show that the fabrics that I'm finding that I'm not weaving are dead stock. I'm, I'm finding my fabrics at yard sales, at thrift shops. They're going to go into the landfill unless I or someone finds them and uses them. So this fabric that's been given up on or it's small pieces, it seemingly doesn't seem like enough to do something with. I'm trying to show that they can still be used and be used beautifully. It's really a goal about the environment with what I'm doing, that we can take things that have been given up on and still make them beautiful and functional. Everything that I make, I try to have it be functional, whether I'm weaving a potholder or sewing a coat, because a coat is protecting us from the elements, so it's, it is functional. Yeah, oh yeah, definitely. Yeah. 2019, you leave a commission job that was a lot of work and a lot of stress to pursue your dream. Go to school, uh-huh. What did that feel like when you left that job and you no longer had all those demands on you? You started school right away. I started taking classes pretty much full time. It was kind of shocking. Was it scary? Oh, terrifying. Terrifying because um, there's some savings that I had to fall back on, but you're thinking, how is this going to work? And questioning, like, why do I believe I can do this? Except I kept thinking if I could take three to five years, I could make this work. I could take the right classes that I would need to spend serious time learning how to sew and then figuring out, well, how do you market it? How do you do the social media? All of that. From leaving a full-time job, people were saying, well, she's retired. And it's like, no, I'm sorry, I'm just not old enough to retire. Leaving what was really a 60 to 80 hour a week job to doing my own thing, one of the shocks was just like email. Because for years, I've received over 100, lots of times 120, 140 emails a day. And I was used to answering every one of those, you know, that the, the day didn't finish till all the email was answered and any quotes or whatever the next steps that went with that. So massive time there and then slowly seeing that trickle go away and all of a sudden wondering, has the world forgotten about me? And just having to balance all of that and just keep in mind, this is my new goal. It's, it's going to be quiet for a while because a lot of those social networks just stopped. A lot of my clients had over the years become my friends and I just reminded myself, in order to keep friendships, you have to just reach out. But then, of course, with COVID and all that. How yeah. did COVID affect your going out on your own? We still did school, but with masks. The door opened school, and then some of the classes ended up being Zoom and all that. And I basically didn't go out very much. I mean, walking the dogs was about it and watching the news and wondering what to do next. I kept trying to think about just trying to dig in and, and keep sewing and trying to learn how to do that in spite of everything but there's been months where you just I, don't know, I think we we're all kind of lost we were trying to figure out what's gonna ha are we gonna die I mean it just everyone had different levels of fear and I think all of us learned to respect the fact that everybody had a different perspective on COVID and how it affected them there's different levels of fear I think being really sensitive to that and respecting those feelings was was like a huge takeaway for me you sewed a lot, I take it, over the yeah. last two years. At one point or two, tried to set up the big looms, but decided I had to focus on sewing right now that one of these times I'll get around to doing more weaving. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hey guys, thanks for listening. I hope you're enjoying the creative push. These artist interviews are a labor of love, but it sure would help if you'd consider supporting this podcast with a small monthly donation to help sustain the work and time it takes for me to produce future episodes. You can click the support button or you can click the link below in the show notes. Any support is greatly appreciated and you can cancel at any time. Either way, I'm glad to have you here. Please subscribe and share. Now let's get back to the show. Give us an idea the type of work that you do and why you chose that kind of sewing. I like things that are functional. I decided that I kind of like women's coats. One reason is that not a lot of people are doing them. Another is that I found 
a specific pattern folkwear out of Asheville. And I thought it was a beautiful pattern. I made it once and then had different friends or st- fellow students try it on and realize the swing coat has a lot of motion to it. It doesn't button. It's kind of free. It has pockets. There is an element in the back that I changed the pattern where when the coat opened up in the back, I saw that as an opportunity for design, changed the pattern and made it into a flare, and then started combining different fabrics to make that work. I thought that Nashville had a market where I could do signature women's coats, but have the coats be more like a, a denim or a canvas or fabric that fit the Nashville climate better. It seems to me that no one else is doing them. And so if I was started to sell them, that maybe I could actually find that market for a woman that wanted a signature coat. And my overall idea is that every year I would try to find one or two new designs and that I would really concentrate on women's coats once or twice a year have a new offering i just really like making those and then have kind of fallen into the women's shawls that use less fabric they don't take as long to sew and they are also a classic design element because i think a lot of women like a third piece where you've got your jeans and a t-shirt and you want to class it up and go out well the coat or the shawl can easily do that and it just elevates the way that someone feels about themselves i like it because i think a lot of women are going to like it especially once they start to try them on and see how they feel. Great. I hope I'm right. <laughs> You're also making pot holders and you've got the cards. Pot I weave pot holders. I love the colors and the pattern and the combinations of those. There are lots of fun, but they're functional. Over the years, I have given some to friends as gifts, and everyone always tells me they're the best pot holders they've ever used. They're oversized, so they fit your hands. They're cotton, so they're washable. They're beautiful. They're like hanging a little piece of woven art on your wall if you're hanging them up. And most all of the things that you make, even your coats, are easily washable, correct? Oh, yes. I think that's important. It costs money to go to the dry cleaner. Things get dirty, and to be able to just throw them in the washer or dryer, so I think do, it's important. You, you even have a coat that you made from drop cloths from Home Depot. Yes, it's one of my favorite. I love that. I've made, I've made a few of them now. That fabric, I tried it by accident. But it gets softer the more you wash it. And I've been hoping that some artist friends would actually use their drop cloth and spill paint on them and give them to me to sew into coats so they would have that layer of history. I think they would be absolutely beautiful. I found that it's a really nice weight canvas for a coat. It gets softer the more you wash it, and it looks awesome on everybody. Do you have a specific technique with how you sew? I love finding fabric different places. You just Sometimes you just never know where you're going to find it, like yard sales, estate sales, thrift shops, smart art and craft supplies out in uh, out by Opryland off Briley Parkway is one of my favorite places to find stuff. Mike and I were traveling back one weekend from like the hole in wall Tennessee area and we decided to take the country roads and I saw a little fabric store so I, I begged him to stop and he's so sweet. He stopped at this little tiny fabric store and I looked around and didn't see anything and went to leave and the owner of the store was there and she said oh did you see the uh, rummage sale in the back which is like remnants. So I went back there and I saw a roll of an oversized plaid that was a really nice canvas weight. And I thought, oh, I think I really like this. And I knew it'd be a lot more work to match the plaid, but I thought it would be a beautiful coat. Anyway, I brought it up and she started to measure it out because I need a good six yards. And as she took it off the roll, realized at least a foot of the fabric at the bottom was all mold and water damage. It was just so nasty. She said, oh, I'm so sorry. I didn't realize this. She said, I'll just throw it away unless you you, you can have it if you want it. I took it. <laughs> I liked the challenge of wondering if I could fix that fabric. I've, I brought it home and I was able to get out. I cut off several inches and then I soaked it in OxyClean and detergent. But soaking that and learning how to use that, I was able to get out the mold and I revived the fabric. I had just barely enough for one coat. Actually, on the cuff of that coat, I had to piece some fabric together. It's a plaid and kind of like a beige with a red and a blue. I'm so proud of that coat. I think it's gorgeous and it's got a whole lot of character to it. But knowing that that fabric was absolutely going in the landfill and I fixed the fabric, it's a fun looking coat. And I love doing that. It, It is a lot more time, but keeping it out of the landfill and giving it another life, I just love that. Most of your fabric you're finding at thrift shops and garage sales and things like 
that. Yes. And recently, I, I see a decent amount of vintage linens, like placemats and napkins, and it seems a lot of people don't use those anymore. So I've started fashioning some of those into shawls. That's really fun. And the linen feels so nice. I think for the most part, you wouldn't guess that these were placemats or napkins because they look really good. Mm -hmm. And again, giving a new life to something, it makes me really happy. I love to weave on an ankle loom. You're using your hands to manipulate it rather than harnesses. You're pushing and pulling with your fingers. You're not going to find ankle that's more than two or at the very most like three inches wide. I'm weaving these and it's making like a long length of fabric. I'm weaving those and I'm using them as what I would call an embellishment to trim the coats or to be worn as a belt. Or in the past I've woven lots and lots of yardage and sewn them together and then use them to chair bottom. The type of chair bottoming that the shaker woman used to use where they wove the fabric and then they wound it around the bottom of a chair and then they weave it in and out in the opposite direction to create a functional, really comfortable chair bottom. Mm -hmm. And I love to do that. What does creativity mean to you? I think it's fun. I think I've learned how to give myself permission to be creative. I think it was a little scary in the beginning. Creativity now is taking that time just to try something, to experiment, to see what's going to happen here. Having that feeling when you get lost in that, you're not really quite sure how it's going to work or what it's going to be, but you're so involved in the process and seeing if it's going to work that you're lost. That's, that's like the best of creativity to, to me, just seeing what happens. What inspires you or what motivates you to create? I get inspired lots of time by things that I find. And sometimes it's a ball of yarn. Sometimes it's a piece of fabric or a scrap of ribbon. Just little odds and ends. Sometimes at a yard sale, I couldn't tell you why I was buying something, but I know it's going to work. I've started doing some little art collages of putting things together. Some of them just don't work, but some of them are so much fun. Do you get stuck? Oh, yeah. And what do you do when you get stuck? Read. I do love to read. So I think I've learned just to walk away and just find a really good book and Enjoy the book. What would you like to learn that you haven't learned yet? Oh, I'd love to learn how to be a really good weaver. I really want to do rugs and I want to do rag rugs. I read Roseanne Cash's autobiography and she mentioned how art and soul changed her and it opened up that creativity within her. And I thought, oh, I hope art and soul does the same for me, but next year I'm going to find out. Where do you see your business going in the future? What's well, ahead? It's going to stay small. It's going to be slow fashion. If a lot of people find out about my coats and really want them, hopefully they'll talk to me and they'll be willing to wait a, a little bit and let me do the process because I have no desire to hire anybody. Doing collaboration would be great and fun. I find a lot of joy in working out of my home with my husband and my dogs here. And mm -hmm. I don't want to get into major commercial business. Been there, done yeah. that. Nope. This is about personal joy and balance and family happiness, seeing how good I can be at something for me. The learning and the studying and the trying things, it's really for me. And the benefit might be that my friends and customers, you know, end up with a really nicely done product that they like and can wear. I just want to see what I can do. And where can people find your... Well, I'm working on the website, so Lambert Clark LLC. I'm really hoping to learn Squarespace and get that up before the end of the year. I'm going to be at the Soapop. We'll be at the Clay Lady Campus uh, off of Lebanon Road here in Nashville, December 3rd and 4th. Hopefully people can find me at pop-up markets, you know, in the future here in Nashville. And now do you have an Instagram? The Instagram is Lambert Clark LLC. Well, I'm so excited to share your story, and I can't wait for people to see some of the coats that you've made. Thank you, Sherry. I'm still so new at this and waiting to see where it goes, but I appreciate the kind words and your time and everything. Thank you. Thank you for being my guest on The Creative Push. Thank you so much for listening. As always, my intention is to offer inspiration that excites you to want to get out there and create something amazing. Be sure to check out some of the other episodes. There's more information below in the show notes, including links to other great stories, tips, and resources. Drop me a message or comment at any time, and I hope that you'll sign up to be a part of this creative tribe.